done. How do I do this? <laughs> change. Here? John, is it okay? I was talking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your patience. All right, so I'm going to start, and I'm going to tell you all the things I don't know, okay? So I was given this opportunity. I thought, hey, this would be something I should pass by the person that I report to here, and he said, yeah, you should do that. I was like, no. Okay, that wasn't the answer I was going for, but he said yes. So I am going to fumble my way through building a volunteer team that you can count on. I'm going to give you a little bit of a resume, which sounds really kind of, I don't like. But anyway, my name is Natasha Penny. And uh, in 2006, I began volunteering in our children's ministry out of a mandate. So I was told, you have kids, you serve. My attitude, not so great about that. It was not, it was not the right heart you wanted in kids' ministry. Let's just put it that way. But I started. I started serving. I hadn't served in the church to that point. I, this church here, I've been here since then. In 2007, I moved to youth ministry, which was more my thing. Like, I loved youth ministry. And uh, I had the ability to, and the, the opportunity to provide specific uh, support during retreats and events, which for us at that point was like 75 high schoolers on a school bus, taking them out into the, uh, the boonies somewhere and then cooking over a campfire. I'm grateful that I'm not doing that anymore, but I really, really enjoyed it at that point. Um, I had a bus license, so it seemed logical. Let's have her drive the bus as well and then cook the food. Uh, seemed to make sense to them at the time. During that time period, as I was growing as a volunteer, I would do anything at that church because I believed in what was going on, and I was excited to do that. So um, I somehow, again, bus license, it was like, hey, we have a bus shuttle that needs to go from this parking lot to this parking lot. It's like, sign me up. I want to do that. Um, again, very odd, odd little things that I was doing, but any opportunity I could be a part of the church, I would. Um, I knew something was happening here that I wanted to be a part of, and so I believed in what was the mission was, and so I was all in. In 2008, my husband was fi hired, fired, not fired. <laughs> surprise um, he was hired full-time here as well and the common joke was as I was painting walls I was, I was cleaning things out organizing didn't we hire your husband not you so in 2009 I was actually hired on staff as the children's ministry coordinator so during that time I led I recruited I cared and grew teams of volunteers in 2013 my role was split between children's and youth where I led and recruited and cared for volunteers. In 2014 was the first time I had the opportunity to really build a team of my own. And that was for something that we called Easter Together. So that meant, let's take everything that we have within our church walls, go to a soccer field and have kids men on an AstroTurf, and then in an arena also have a service at the same time. So we needed teams of people to pull that off. And I had the opportunity to be a part of that. Um, in 2019, and then it was decided that my focus would be events, which is what you're participating in today, as well as communications and other special projects, which means anything that they ask you to do. That is, that is what I do, and I smile about it. Um, then my most recent change again is now I oversee our volunteers that do any of our first impressions, so welcome uh, ushers, greeters, parking, again, anything that I'm asked to do. So I just want to share uh, some personal wins and challenges and then losses, actually, as well, so my failures. Um, but we're going to start because I am the kind of person as a student that I don't do well just sitting, so I like to participate. So for those of you that were late, didn't get to have candy, this is your opportunity to have some candy. And my lovely Jocelyn <laughs> is going to write on the board so I don't make one of you guys do it. Um, so I would like to create right now a list of what is the perfect volunteer. In your head, what, is, what do you guys feel the perfect volunteer would be? Who wants to throw something out there first? Veronica. Oh, committed. Annie. 
Oh, Veronica, technically I'm supposed to throw candy at you now too. My aim is technically sometimes good. <laughs> Loves the Lord, okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, flexible. Flexible, that's a good word. Anyone else have some more? Yes? Reliable. Who said reliable? But your hand was up and then I heard a voice. Good. Reliable. Yep. There you go. Do you want the candy this time? Okay. Do you want another coffee, Chris? Uh, short, short at the end there. <laughs> oh, okay. Anybody else? Anyone else? More words? Independent. Independent. Okay. Do you care what you get? Qualified? <laughs> Who said qualified? I do not. You still don't want the candy, okay. <laughs> Teachable. Teachable. That's another good word. She's worried about her spelling, guys. Team. This we're all going to be a supportive. Uh, Anything else? Perfect volunteer. Team player. Team player. Anyone else? Humbled. Humbled or humble? Humble. humble. <laughs> Words matter. Yep. Sorry? Uplifting. Uplifting, encourager, yeah. Would you like that? I didn't give you the chocolate. Smart as it is. You're good, okay. Any other words out there, Judy? Other volunteers. Mm, yes. Love those people. Leaders. Do you want your chocolate? Takes initiative. Takes initiative. Well, it's good, so people can take pictures of it. Takes initiative. Any other words? Prayerful. Prayerful. You got any other words out there? Goes where they're needed. <coughs> With a good flexible world. I'm stopping throwing this out because I'm getting distracted by these good ideas. So I'm going to put it here and you can be rewarded when necessary. Any other words out there? Perfect volunteer? Mature, mature in Good. wisdom or mature in age? <laughs> I worked in kids a long time. <laughs> Any other ones? Yes? Volunteer dives in. Dives in. You got any others? Enjoys? Yep. Yep. Self-aware. You can have the arrow bar. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any others? No. This is a good list. So does anybody in this room have a single volunteer that has every single one of those things? So when my husband and I were putting, the, put, no, I was putting this together and I was going over this with him and we were making my list and he was giving out his and we we're going through all of that and we were, I was like, well, what does that mean when you see all of these things and if everybody has every single one? I could, you could add here too, right? Production or worship, they can play the guitar, they can, they have different skills. Um, he said staff member, and I said a unicorn. So it was very different. Um, but to have a perfect volunteer would mean that we were all sinless and um, the ability to do all of these things at the exact same time, right? So this is great to aspire to for sure and what we're trying to mimic and things like that. But it's also very difficult to come to a situation where you're never going to have to correct somebody or you're never going to have to train them again or... You know, you have the volunteer that's like, I will go anywhere but there, um, things like that, right? So we are aiming for something like this, but we may never, ever see it. Even as staff members, we can have poor hearts sometimes, right? Like I think about how when I started, I was told to be with the children, and I would not have had any of these characteristics at that time, other than I loved the Lord, obviously. <laughs> so I did it. So that was just, yeah, thank you for participating with me with that. So what I would like to just remind us is that um, 1 Peter 
4 says, As each of us has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever. Amen. I can also point to 1 Corinthians uh, 12 to 27, which I will not read because I'll probably stutter, but um, you guys can point, write, write that down if you like. I personally love watching people find the right spot and serve in the right place using their gifts for the Lord. So that's where I'm always going for. That's my, my personal goal when I'm here. So now, if I was honest, back in 2009, I quickly became the staff member that believed the lie that I was the answer and I had to do it all. Anyone been there? Maybe just me. Um, I can tell you that I learned later when I wish I'd like to admit that it was sooner that I needed the rest of the body or I wasn't going to be able to do what I was responsible for. So a couple of Sundays ago was a good reminder of that for me, of why I need the volunteers that I can count on. So it was a communion Sunday, so I oversee that as well, which here means filling 4,000 communion cups, <laughs> double cupped with a cracker on the bottom and juice on the top. And there's 15 minutes between service to reset that. Sounds fun, right? Um, that's not everybody's situation, but with proper planning, you can do it. Volunteers you can count on, you can do it. This was a particular Sunday that uh, you, know, you have to clean the rows, you have to turn it over. The service decided to be late. I don't have control over that. You need about 100 volunteers to do what we do once a month in this situation. So I have team leaders, I have like thought through this methodically. And before I had hit the church parking lot, has anybody seen that meme where it's like the PCO is rejecting, everybody's declining in PCO and the tiles are falling off the wall? Okay, that was my morning. So I got a flood of, I'm sick, my kids are sick, I double booked myself, I have flu, all of these things. And I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm in the car, I'm trying to figure out what I can figure out in 15 minutes. My husband was driving, don't worry, it wasn't me. And um, I, like I was already sweating when I had gotten here. And so I was left to try to manage all of this and really right in that moment went, wow, I need this team <laughs> because I can't do this again. That wasn't because they couldn't be counted on, it was just circumstance. But again, I'm at the front of the church trying to stack communion cups, I drop a tray, I have juice running down my arms, it's on the front floor and I'm like, I don't know what to do, <laughs> I don't know what to do. And so I literally saw one of my volunteers from years ago we were in a small group together, and I just looked at her, and I felt like a first aid responder, and I said, I need you to go to the kitchen. Get these two trays. Bring them back here to me. And uh, again, we have four minutes. <laughs> so this is why we need volunteers. This is why we need to pass things off. This is why we need to delegate and equip and give opportunities to others. So I believe that there are a few things that we can be doing to build strong teams, and my biggest thing for me is knowing your volunteers, all of them. So these are, would be my sub-points, if that is what you want to call it. So forming relationships is vital. Um, creating personal connection with your team. Members build stronger relationships and a better team and a volunteer experience. We can do this at a very high level. First name, details we find in PCO, if that's the database you guys use. We can take it from their outward appearance. Are they tall, are they short, introverted, extroverted? Things they have written on a volunteer form but I believe we can, can't count on someone we don't know deeper than that. So that's always my goal. Can we go to the next level? So personally for me, I sit with every volunteer and listen to their salvation story, how they ended up here at Hope with us, um, why they wanna serve, and I do a lot of interrupting. So tell me more about that. Like I wanna know why they moved from Africa to here or from the States to here or about their unsaved children. Um, how they've been a part of our church. And this informs how I can pray for them and understand where they are um, in our discipleship model here at the church. Are they new? Are they just trying to get to know people? All of that comes from that conversation. So knowing and investing isn't easy. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes effort. What could investing look like with a small start? So my small start was prayer. When your team knows you're actively praying for them, you're following up with them with certain prayer requests, 
you're showing that you're invested in them. As a leader, you want to care for them, and there is value in that. So they feel seen and they feel heard. So that's a big thing for me. Uh, what comes from knowing your volunteers? You figure out a lot of things. So I have a kind of a list of a little category of volunteers here for you. The I'm never at ease volunteer. So this volunteer is excitable, anxious. Things are a fire like almost immediately. So you know how to come alongside that person and be gracious and provide them maybe with a little bit more. Anybody have any of those? Nobody? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. The no-show volunteer. Um, I want to volunteer, but I have a hard time actually making it. I would say the normal volunteer, typical average, shows up, is willing, but it's just baseline. The not listening volunteer. I'm going to do what I want because I know better and you don't know anything. I, uh, anyone? No? Just my team? Okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> love those, love those. Uh, the silent quitter. Doesn't show, doesn't respond, was around a lot, and then nowhere anymore. This could be for multiple reasons, though, and this comes down to the knowing. <coughs> What's going on in their home? Have you even checked on them? Um, to, to my shame, just the way I was, I'll talk about how we do things now at the end, but I had a volunteer have a baby. I didn't even know. That's nine months I missed it. Um, but we, the way we're structured, her team lead did know, but I felt awful, right? And so things like that. Um, that's why she wasn't serving. She finally declined in PCO and said, I had a baby. Oh, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad that I didn't acknowledge that. Um, the high capacity volunteer, which I call, you're in the wrong seat on the bus. They are way more capable and valuable, um, but they haven't been asked yet. And then we have the, the those that do and don't like change. Anybody have those guys? They are champions of change. They love what you're doing. It's effective. Everything you do is amazing. Of course we want those people close to us. And then the other people again, I'm not changing because we did this in 2007 and that's the right way when so-and-so did it and was the leader. Anyone? No? no. Okay. <laughs> and then the feedback volunteer, for better or for worse. I love feedback. That's why Jocelyn's in this room right now so she can give me feedback at the end. I. That can be good and that can be bad, but you need to know who you're listening to for your feedback. You don't want to just surround yourself by yes people. You need the people that also are analytical and can see things. And you need to be able to hear it because we are not perfect, even as staff members. So you don't know things like this without knowing your team, observing them, and investing time in them. So we're going to go back to the, the, the candy throwing if you want it. Does anybody in here, because I love to not reinvent the wheel, have good ideas about how they invest in their team for others in this room. Nobody has a good idea. We don't know everything here. Yes? Depending on the size of your team, um, you could buy a, a personalized Christmas gift each year. Figure out what their interests are, their likes, you know, yep. what their gift bag looks up just for them. You know, if you have a huge team, that might not work, but my leader just picked you. Yep. So we have, for our youth ministry here, we did an we, I, as onboarding. I have an all about me form. Mm -hmm. I ask questions like cat or dog on that form. And I, you know, people think I'm really <laughs> smart, but it's written down somewhere that I remember they like Reese's Pieces. So, think, yeah, personalized. Anyone else? Good ideas to show and how to form relationships? Um, I think team building activities like kind of outside the ministry. Mm -hmm. Again, depending on the Oh, I thought you were. Yes. Yes. On the same note, so personalized gifts. Um, just handwritten notes can go a long way. They do. Um, I 100% agree. It shows a lot of extra attention. It shows a lot of personalization. Um, my wife sends a team of, of 180 volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, so Christmas time is nuts writing that many handwritten notes, but um, she's continually blown away at how impactful it is. Mm -hmm. It is huge. Who gets anything in the mail other than a bill? <laughs> Goes a long way. Not to bound, but I think it's being present. So I try a youth administrator first and trying to go into the classrooms of ages and getting set up and just do what I can to like help them set up, but just ask them about their week and just have those conversations. Yep. So that, you know, and doing that before anything ministry related, just connecting mm -hmm. with them sort of individually. And then we do have a, a pretty large number of volunteers as well. So we have sort of what we call support leads. And so they're kind of in that role. Like they 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's just they're 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 like, okay, you get to know these people really well. You know their faults, you know what they're getting burnt out or like yep. all those kinds of things. Um so those are some tools that we're using. Yep. Okay, good. Yes. Um so I'm the um, research head for the summit. Okay. And our team is like spread out all over North America. So it's hard to get together. Um but prior to like having to go on this trip we do have like a, a weekend during the long weekend where they all just like come, come together. together. You have it. You're stuck from home. Here's yep. your cell phone when you write. Here's your, you know, hand phone. All these things. Hand yep. sanitizer, whatever. It's just really, they know what they're doing at that point. Yep. Mm-hmm. Anybody else have any other ideas? Yes. Uh, what place do you use for when you leave from work in the morning before you start? Just do you have any idea what to wrap? Do you have a dog? Like a suit? Whatever. Yep. Oh wow, that's intense. I want to come to that. I want to come. Three minutes. Okay. Do you time them? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Good. I love that. I love that. This or that. That's a good idea. Yep. Yep. Accessible. Oh. Accessible to everybody. Three minutes. Three minutes. Anyone else? Ways to invest. Mm-hmm. For a lot of these people who are maybe working five hours a week, six already. hours a week, mm-hmm. five hours, whatever, and then they're trying to do everything they can to make sure I'm not, um, I'm not setting meetings on the calendar or something that can communicate efficiently through a video or an email or through something. Um, and and honestly, if they're not, the the response of that would be to have way more time to be on virtual time with people, mm-hmm. which carries. Yep. Um, to know them. Also, a lot more research as well, um, despite them already being in all these different different environments. So, I don't know. But so I think it's really weird to be trying to have like five or six meetings a year. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it doesn't allow for much. Nope. Nope. It's great. So I'm gonna that will go for me right now. My next thing to point out um, to, to be able to have teams you can count on clarity. So clarity. It's our job to support and care for our team members, providing consistency, communication, and understanding of what the expectation is when someone is serving. So if, I know for me personally, and I'm sure for many others, people don't like the unknown or looking or feeling foolish. So that may be, again, just me, but never comfortable in that spot. So volunteers are more likely to be more committed if they know what to expect and what we are trying to accomplish. So having the mission for what your ministry and church uh, at the forefront of the filter of everything that you guys are doing. So are we properly preparing them? Again, I'm gonna share some examples. Or are we sending information the night before? I mean, I have been thinking about things for months and months and months, so I just assume that everybody's thinking about things. And I'm doing it on my timeline only to realize I have put somebody else in a spot where they're, they're, they're anxious and stressed and wondering and then people send me an email, where's this or where's that? And they have every right to say that. Um, and I'm like, it's coming. Like, I've, you know, for months we've planned this, but they don't know that. So clarity and communicating. The expectation before they get there. So songs, lyrics, lesson plans, instructions on how, example, this conference is going to run, pe- where people are going to stand, things like that. So how do you guys provide clarity? Is it still the email? Is it MailChimp? Is it... A private Facebook group. I don't even know if Facebook is still something people use. I'm not on social media. Um, Is it videos? Because you can say something in a video two minutes instead of nobody reads the email, right? We all know that. You got to say the first thing that you want at the top. 
One trick that I have done um, with different groups of people is I bury random questions in my emails. And if they answer them, how am I said chicken or beef? And everybody that responded with chicken, are they a question mark? And I didn't say why, I brought them a burrito. <laughs> and like, or like gum or mint, bringing gum or mint to people. So I bury little like treasures inside to see those that actually read. Um, I've done the thing where I, we have used MailChimp in the past um, with some of our teams. And if you do, for those of you that you don't know, I'm sure you, maybe you do or don't. I find MailChimp a little bit creepy because it tells you when you've clicked or when you've not clicked. But I left a button that said click here but didn't go anywhere. And so for the person that clicked on it the most times, they got a prize. <laughs> so like I'm always embedding little things in there. And like they would be like, I clicked, it didn't go anywhere. And I'm like, but it did. <laughs> it did. So trying to like weave, <laughs> are they getting your content? Are they getting your content? So that would be one way that we try to communicate. It is a lot of email or a lot of video um, personally, but is there anything that you guys are doing right now with your teams that might benefit somebody else? Like we do, like we do team huddles at the beginning. So, so many minutes before we will have a meeting, we just say the high points in that because we know that even though we've said it in email, it's still not translating, things like that. Anybody have things that they do specifically with their teams that will blow people's minds in this room? Yes, you will. Go for it, Judy. We're here doing this together. None of us have got it right. She is. Any other ways that we're clearly commuting to commuting communicating? Yes. Uh, I will often produce um, like minute and a half training videos mm -hmm. throughout the season. Um, the reason I found putting out like a three minute video was like too long. I didn't want to. Yeah. Like, so statistically, video. statistically, the first twenty seven seconds is what they actually yeah. watch. So yeah. think of all that hard work you're doing four minutes in. Nobody, nobody. Yeah, it's it's sad. I try to keep it like. <laughs> 45 seconds is yeah. the ideal window, but just the information out quick. And people seem to like videos. They think it's yep. quick, it's easy, they don't have to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great way to get everyone on the same page. Yep, it's true. You can do that on your your smartphone, too. You can. It doesn't have to be a massive production. But, yep. So I'm a, I'm a youth pastor, I lead youth leaders with them. Um, at the start of each night, we, we have our little huddle. Yep. Like Mm -hmm. that they take with to the conference meeting that has the main takeaways from the message that we have, mm -hmm. and then a place where I tell my small group prayer requests, and then I leave like pertinent announcements or information on it, and I just say what's calling to you. If you just keep holding this thing all night long, like you'll be good, it, you know, you'll, you'll never forget why did we all come here today, and also like just has a little spot in the notes, or has a mm -hmm. little spot um, where I can just send, like write them a little handwritten note or a little message or whatever, so mm -hmm. it's just kind of like a it's a multi-purpose little piece of paper that's just, you know, once you have your template made, it takes 10 minutes to make, but it really pays off. It's it awesome. does, it does. So when I was in high school, that would have been called Cole's Notes. I don't know if that lands anywhere in this room still. It was a real short brief, yeah. Any other good ideas about clarity and communicating with our teams? Bring consistency. Don't have to be afraid, yes. Trying to keep things to 100 words. So not original, but you do like lots of systems. So when you're onboarding new volunteers, yep. you get like, what is the purpose of your role? What's the expectation? Yep. And then basically to like keep the basic tasks very centralized within yourself. Yep. And honestly, I've been really helpful across the years. And I finally just started doing my podcast. Make this idea. Make this idea. And I was like, no, it needs to write. 
they do. They do need clarity. It's true. It's true. The next thing I would say is acknowledgement. So saying thank you, and I'm going to, the cards here, uh, like that goes a long way. How has that person impacted your team while serving the Lord? How and where can you point out the Lord's gifting in their lives? And what would a handwritten note do in a mailbox during the week? Um, I personally have a box in my office of every handwritten note. I might have one from you, Joyce, in there <laughs> um, for over the years. And I, I, I save them. And they mean so much to me, these words that leaders have poured into me. And I know of even, I mean, this wasn't a volunteer situation, but I had a child when I was in kids ministry. He kept every single handwritten birthday card that he had received from like all his way through and was sad in sixth grade when he stopped getting them. But I had moved to youth ministry, so I started doing them again. <laughs> so, I was, But it was impactful, like the kind words that we can say. Um, which means at Christmas time, for me right now, I'm writing 400 plus cards by hand. But I value that. That's a personal opinion for me. I, again, no, I don't want to mandate anything for anybody here. But I know how important those words are to me. And I try to know my volunteers enough to say, something that I have remembered through that year or an incidence where I saw them excel in a situation or could point out at a certain event or a certain time to say, like, I, like I see you and I appreciate you and I know. Sometimes thank you is the only thing you need to say. Um, we, again, we don't know where people are that day or what they've, they're coming from or the hard season that they're in, but to be seen, uh, I have found personally impactful, and I know that when I do it for others, it seems to be doing the same thing. So I'm sure we've had those moments, right? So somebody comes around and says the right thing at the right time of the Lord, and that just pushes them to go us that little bit more. Um, they can be directive, they can be encouraging, um, or sometimes even in those kind of ways, uh, acknowledging, you can acknowledge, I see you doing this, but I do feel like you could do this. Um, you're so good at this, but you are showing me uh, that you are more capable, that high capacity volunteer. So appreciation for us, it looks very different. Uh, we do the cards. I, pr I have taken it on where I bring my team of leads into my own home. I don't have a big home, but I have learned over the years that nobody cares <laughs> what my house is look like. But if there's food on the table, that's enough. And so sharing food with people, meals, doing it in that way of letting, like, again, I letting my guard down and welcoming people in, huge. I've seen the benefits of that. Instead of meeting at a restaurant. In a restaurant, you're talking over each other and you're, you have the ability to get guards down in the home. So that's a little thing that I would do for certain teams that I have when showing appreciation. Um, we do gift cards. We do presents at Christmas. So sometimes there's a coffee card in that, that thank you. Sometimes it is me baking cookies. Sometimes it's like little things like that to tangibly show. And then there's also the random going out of their way during the week. And I have acknowledged it. I don't wait till Christmas to say it. Again, I would send that note or that po postcard in that situation or phone call or stop them and try to have those moments. There's somebody who said that over there in that corner of that specifically touch point to point that out of the evidence of what I'm seeing the Lord do in them. So is there any other appreciation that people do here that they've seen go a long way for others in their groups? For a, yes, yeah, blaming volunteers. Paid, so yep. like, yep. like, everyone blame me, please. <laughs> You're the top. <laughs> yes, no, yep. Like Protecting. Yeah. Yeah. You're acknowledging them by protection. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I appreciate you. You don't need to feel bad. Yep, for sure, <clears throat> for sure. Any other appreciation that we have done in the past or hope to aspire to or... So are you gifted with an amazing memory, or do you do something with that information when you write down? I, like, I, I cheat with everything. I write everything yeah. down in my phone. I'm talking to people. I'm like, yeah. 
set a yeah. reminder. <laughs> our small group, we, uh, we actually keep a run for every child team. Okay. Um, but then the volunteer team that we run, I'm not sure. If you can remember. Or not, yeah. yeah. Any other appreciating things that we can do? Yep. I'm a one trick pony. Okay. I'm only going to do one thing, and I don't like repeating things that I'm not going to do later. So we always get soap, and it just makes me feel refreshed. Oh. So but it's working. You always get bottles of soap. Everybody needs soap, <laughs> hand soap, and then they'll remember that they got it from you, and they'll yep. feel treated the same way you did. Yep. So I don't know how long I've been doing that for, but I'm a one trick pony. <laughs> I mean, it's working. But then nobody's going to say like, oh, for another one, like yeah. they, don't, they don't do that. <laughs> Everyone needs soap. Okay? It's true. <laughs> it's true. And it's how true. can you get the kids to like the milk and then stick it on the bottle of soap? Okay, kidsmen. Yeah, little things go a long way. They don't have to be big, extravagant things. We all don't have, are working with the same thing, right? So handwritten words and following up, like you had just shared, massive for acknowledging. Acknowledging our volunteers goes a long way. Um, communication. So we've done a little bit of this already, but does your team feel like there's open communication? Or are they ignored? Or is there regular follow-up? Is it clear to our teams on how they can reach out to us when needed? Um, do they, I know we don't touched on this already in the crowd, um, have clear role descriptions and understanding of what their expectations and goals and the mission that we have as a team are working towards? Um, again, ex expectations and roles define, defined help keep everyone in the know, which helps maintain unity. So a big thing that I would say is without clarity, there's conflict, which then has Confu clarity, conf confusion, conflict. Um, and nobody likes conflict. <laughs> so do you provide feedback? Or most importantly, do you listen to feedback? Um, or our volunteers, are, our volunteers are often the ones that are on the front lines dealing with the congregant that doesn't want to move from the outside of the road to the inside. Anyone do the ushers team? <laughs> um, to make it easier to seat the later people to your service, um, <laughs> or the person that feels uh, it's too hot or too cold in the building, or here's how difficult it is to connect in this church, or um, like, are you listening to those things when people come and tell you? Now again, we have our volunteers that everything is an emergency, when we know that it's not, so we have to be kind and gracious. But there are team members that they have valuable things, and we don't know everything. Like, just because I am, I don't know how many of you are paid to be where you are. Um, I know that I am paid to be where I am and I'm grateful for that, but I don't know everything. I'm not the one that is having their eyes rolled or my favorite from when my team leads the other day, the way we enter our worship center on the weekend, people will literally walk around them and kind of go like this <laughs> and try not to be told that they can't go into the worship center because it's full, but they just won't listen, right? So this is an ongoing problem and if I don't listen to him sharing this with me and trying to navigate it, or I just bluff them off, then I'm never going to learn, right? So there's value in listening to your team members. Um, I learn a lot from them. Again, they are, I, so I, we do regular check-ins. So for us, specifically with our welcome team ministry, we have captains. Um, Judy already said she was one of them. We have somebody that oversees our security team, our medical team. We have three service teams per weekend that are 8.30, 10, 15, and 12. So there's a leader over each one of those, as well as our info desk and our connections ministry. So I'm pouring into those people that lead that now. But I'm trusting those people to give me what I need to be able to focus on and to change and to, and to ponder and plan for. So I am actively following up with them and wanting, and we have um, ways to um, capture that. Either sometimes it's an email, sometimes it's a form. I love my forms. Um, and I value the answers that are in there. I, the joke has been my love language is forms completed. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I follow up. You haven't given me my feedback yet. Uh, is there any other ways? We've touched on some of them, communicating to our teams in this way. Um, OK. Like yeah, feedback, like yes. Yeah. Yep. 
that's where I would place my feedback forms in. I ask really random questions. I, I have to be honest, when I first started asking for feedback, I would read it personally every single time. And I was like, this person's attacking me. They're like, I don't, you know, and they weren't. They, they were being open and honest and giving me things to think about. Some things are good, some things are bad, but you have to read it not personally and have to know when to cut it off and, and things like that. Um, but communication goes a long way. Again, people don't like to feel foolish. People don't like to feel like they don't, they're not prepared and they wanna go in knowing the expectations. So communication is massive. Training. So again, this is where I've learned, are you using a sink or swim method? <laughs> Throwing them out there with any without any direction and hoping for the best? Or having mechanisms for training and further growth and responsibility is important. People, again, I can say it over and over again, don't like being uncomfortable or unsure with what they're supposed to do. So are we equipping our volunteers with the where, why, when, and how while they are serving alongside us? Uh, again, I've been there. It's, you, you forget that you think you have to tell people other things, but writing it down, having what we would call a handbook here with all of the role descriptions, how they cross over, um, what they are going to expect or what they could expect, and then there's the unknown, and I say that, and every time I sit down with somebody, I'm like, you sometimes won't know until you get asked a question that I've never even heard before. Can I bring my bunny rabbit into service? No. So the volunteer's like, what do I do? <laughs> we, well, that's a new one, right? So things like that. So you can't write that in a handbook, but you can write some pretty staple things of times of when you're gonna get there and what you're gonna do and how long you're going to do it for, and equip them the best they can. So we try to do that with every new volunteer that comes on. They get that version for whatever ministry it is, kids ministry, uh, welcome team, and so on. So clearly writing the expectations down. We do training videos. Sometimes those are funny just to see if people will watch them. And so we do like little spoof things. I, there's one I haven't released yet. It has me running through that parking lot and I'm still a little bit anxious about that video. So <laughs> saving that one for later, but like playing off of what we got, right? Like making it fun. Um, different training, uh, things like that, and uh, following up if they have or haven't read a document, or you sometimes can see that with youth ministry, did that youth ministry. I never know what's going on. Every at the beginning of every week, we send you, I don't tell them this, I'm telling you guys this, the questions, and I see in MailChimp you never open them. No, I don't say, don't say that to them. <laughs> but I know that that, that leader's not prepared, right? And so that's another qu conversation we can go to after that um, when we're hearing things like that when it comes to training. So my last thing here would be, um, well, it's not my last thing, but opportunities. How do we move the person from waving in the parking lot to captaining or leading a team? We use the word captain here. That's gonna come from observing and mentoring and pushing them out of their comfort zone sometimes just a little. So I like my expected box, I like to stay in it, I don't wanna go out of it, but I have because somebody else has kind of kicked me out of the nest and asked me to do a little bit more. So sometimes you never know if someone is willing until you ask. I have been denied publicly in front of people and they're like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. And it's like, oh, okay. But I really felt like I needed to ask and put it out there. Um, and I do now seek after people and I ask them to prayerfully consider the opportunity. I lead with the expectations and bring as much clarity as I can, um, how that role is going to play out for them. And then I follow up. So I do have somebody in my inbox right now that is ignoring me and that's okay. So that I, I, I have a rule of three. I do it three times and then I'm like, okay, it's, it's, I'm not gonna push anymore. But um, I'm actively looking to see, I, I love the welcome team. I would like nobody to leave the welcome team ever but I do recognize that a lot of people can wave and be hospitable, and there are people on my team that shouldn't be on our team. Like, I'm keeping them from where they should be. So that only comes from knowing. So I, again, I don't feel like you can count on a volunteer that you don't know. Um, so how do we identify that? Sometimes it's out of a need. I, and I'll use my communion example. When we came back um, from having the individual cups, I don't know if everybody got to use those for a little while, but that was like a gift. It was just a bin, people just reached in and took it, and now we have to set up the trays again, which I, I also love. 
Um, <laughs> I do. I do love it. I do. I don't like grape juice on my shoes, but I do. I do. I do love it. Uh, but I realized I couldn't do it all, right? So I had to identify new leaders that were consistent and faithful and in small ways. A membership for us is what who serves communion here, so it's not just an open call. Um, and I remember going up to people and, and, and straight up asking them, hey, you're faithful. I see you serve communion. I think you can do more. And knowing that I, like, I could not keep doing what I was doing on a Sunday because it was keeping me from doing what I should do, also should be doing. <laughs> Couldn't be everywhere. So are you actively trying, this one's, this is where I'm going with this. Are you actively trying to replace yourself as a staff member? That one was hard for me. That one was really hard for me. Because I remember the holding things so tightly, and I started with this. I have to be the one to do this. I'm the one that knows how to do it. I'm the only one you can count on. I'm the only one that, you know, is going to do it right. I still struggle with that now, even to this day. But I learned very quickly that as soon as I opened my hands and created these things that I thought I had to do and made them volunteer positions, my team grew, and which then allowed somebody else to use their gifting in different ways. And it freed me up to always, for those of us that are paid staff members, we know our hands are never, if you're also very key leaders in your church, ever empty. They just get replaced with something else. Um, that's been my, my story. So I am actively trying to work myself out of a job always. Nothing should rely on me being here. Nothing. I just get the opportunity right now. So I can guarantee, uh, yeah, somebody else might be even more passionate about filling communion cups than you might be, right? Like, they, like that is their... That I had, I, so one of my volunteers that I would count on the other day called me from Buffalo and said, do you need communion crackers? Because yes, we have to go to the States to get our communion crackers. I was like, I, yes. And she's like, okay. But, but she just, this is something I interact with a lot. And then communion crackers showed up on my desk. And that was because she knows enough and we've been going back and forth and She's passionate about those crackers, so it worked out well for me. She checked Target, and yeah, we're good to February now. Um, but there are people in your life that are going to do that. When you have poured into them and you count on them, you know that that's going to be returned. You also know that you could abuse that, I think, as staff members, right? So you have to be very careful to not be the person that burns out your team. Um, I have been on the receiving end of that, and I think I have maybe led to that too early on is that we are to protect them like this gentleman had mentioned right you want to protect your team as well and part of that is telling them that no you can't do this this we're going to let somebody else do this um, again I challenge you your, e your hands end up empty they will always end up filled with something else mm -hmm. that the Lord has for you always so Practically, I'm going to just go a little bit into my welcome team, specifically how we're doing this right now, and then um, would love to answer questions if you have them. And I'm the kind of person that gets out early at one of these things, and it's like, yes, I can use the bathroom before the next <laughs> session. So I'll do that for you guys, too. Um, onboarding process. So one of the things that we learned very early here is that every single one of our ministries had a different onboarding process. So not sure what databases you guys use, but we, we heavily rely on PCO. Um, we're not using it to its highest capacity, but we're getting better. Right, Judy? Getting better. <laughs> but with that, you can see that um, every form that's filled out goes to somebody's profile. So one of the things that we did to try to simplify here at our church was one form for every ministry mm -hmm. and the same set of expectations. Because feedback... I would have somebody say, I just told you this when I wanted to do X. Like, how many times do you need to hear my salvation story? Now, honestly, our students, I really enjoyed it because it would change every year, <laughs> which was great. Um, but adults, it's usually they, they know their, their story. But you're asking them, and that's a little bit irritating, if we're honest. I don't want to say it seven times, too, right? So we have one form. And it asks the same questions for everybody. We also have the same set of beginning standards. So we have a step one, two, three process here. 
So our expectation on everybody on our team is that you go to step one and step two before you serve. So it's the same across the board. Other things here, you would have to be a member to do certain things and stuff like that. Um, but that's the baseline to get into kids and into welcome and, and stuff like that. So very specific, easy across the board onboarding. Uh, again, I am learning a bit about every single person that comes to my team. I'm making notes physically and mentally so that I can bring these things up in future conversations, provide them with the role descriptions, and I also provide them with the role descriptions that are above where they're starting in hopes that some of them will be like, I could do that, and then with time, maybe they can do that. So you can show them what's completely available. And then I do, um, again, I've already said this, I do my best to be available and present uh, when the teams are serving, interacting them with, with any chance that I get, following up with them, following up on absences. Sometimes people don't communicate that, and that could be for a real reason. Like I mentioned at the beginning, somebody had a baby on my team. Um, but also, is there somebody sick in their home? Is there, are they sick? Do they, are they going through treatments for something? Are they particularly, so following up is massive. I noticed you weren't here. And when you have big teams, even small teams, people are like, how, like, how did you have time for that? Um, big deal. Uh, and then a lot of training. So going, we do a lot of on the job for welcome. So sometimes again, like I said, you don't know until you know. And you're standing there, what you're going to be asked for, having ongoing training. Uh, and we also, in, we, we seek to have one large group training every year where we bring the whole team together when it's the welcome team. It shows how we interact and kind of do the housekeeping of what we are lacking in and what we need to get better in. And then, um, yeah, I said it already. I personally want to keep all my welcome team volunteers always and forever. <laughs> But I do have to recognize that as people come into the church they, and are discipled, they grow in their wisdom and their knowledge and their capabilities. Um, so, I, so I actively have to be saying goodbye to them too. That's the goal. And if they're moving down the discipleship pipeline here, then that's success for the welcome team for me. So I would love to give the opportunity for the next like 10 minutes, I think, is then we're supposed to be done in 15. If people have troubleshooting questions um, or anything that they want to, I will do my best. Yes, sir. Do you have a process or experience in when you talk to the volunteers about <laughs> how they need to be Did you notice I ignored that whole part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are hard. Those are hard. Um, prayer, massive. But sometimes firing a volunteer is never easy never easy. I never do it alone. Mm -hmm. And the, the constant feedback that I'm trying to go for is both ways. So they're providing feedback, I'm providing feedback to them. Like, for instances that I can clearly say that I saw. That's the other thing. I don't like to take any secondhand information, so that's the whole being active um, and seeing, because it can get sticky. There's games of telephone, right? So you, the story you get can be different. Um, So I would start a lot of those with what you're showing is X, but I don't know your heart, only the Lord does. And I don't mean that cheeky. I mean that seriously. Like only the Lord knows what's going on. Is this what you're meaning to portray? And having like a direct, open conversation. Nobody likes those conversations, but at the same time, it will affect everybody. Because then you end up with teams that, oh, so-and-so is here. Right, and it ripples, or and we want to avoid any appearance of evil altogether. So quickly and effectively and directly is how I would handle toxic, but never alone. So because sometimes they hear a different message, and you're like, I didn't say that. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful. But. Anyone else? Never, because somebody needs to wave in the parking lot and somebody needs to usher. So uh, that's a big thing for me. So I had multiplied January, maybe this year. 
so the, the expectations for our welcome team before I inherited it two years ago, the team in the morning would serve from 7.30 to 2.30 every Sunday. And I looked at that going, that's a staff member. I just asked these 25 people to serve for eight hours, mm -hmm. I think if my math is right. And, and for me, that bothered me when I couldn't onboard anybody. I don't have a space for you. Nobody wants to be rejected, right? We're all told that we're supposed to be serving in the church and that we're supposed to be using our gifts, and then you're like, sorry, we're full. Mm -hmm. So I'm actively trying to build, and that's why I'm saying replace myself. I'm constantly trying to make new teams, and I've had different people volunteer in some roles that might be paid at some churches or not, but like, I've had people organize my volunteers as a volunteer role. But I'm trying to never have a closed door. So there's always, there's always room for somebody to join. They might serve less, or I'm creating another opportunity out of a role that needs to be there. Like more leaders, more. So we went from that team serving. We had four teams serving from 7.30 to 2.30 every Sunday. I broke that into three teams. So now there's an 8.30 team, 10.15, and a 12 team. So now I've tripled the amount of people that I need, which is trusting the Lord because I started it without the people I needed. <laughs> I was like, oh, the Lord will figure that out. And he has, right? Like, there's still holes and stuff like that. But I wanted to create more opportunity to be able to onboard the people that were coming to get in the game. Yeah. What's the training process like when somebody tells you they're looking for a servant and you don't know them at all? At all? Yeah. Which is a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, so we, we do the general form. Everybody goes to step one and step two, so hopefully they understand we're front-loading who we are because not everybody loves who we are, mm -hmm. or they'll get partway down this and they'll be like, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do our best there. We ask, we ask also for references. Mm -hmm. So kids' men would have their own reference form, so they're getting like the context of their questions. So we do follow up with references for different people. Uh, depending on the different things that they do, they might have work they have to produce. Like if they're gonna help us with graphics in a volunteer capacity, we'd like to know that they can make graphics, um, and that not just their mom said that it was good. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> um, stuff like that. So we do references, and that would be a big part of also asking if they know anybody here. Part of when I'm sitting with people, I'm asking like discipleship questions, like, are you in group life? And if they say, yes, yeah, so-and-so is my leader, I'm like, oh, okay. Like, then I can follow up with that. I'm trying to glean information all the time with leading questions so that I can get a better picture of this person. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's a chance. So we do have with children's ministry, you, you have to have been here actively for six months before you can participate in a classroom and police checks are necessary and stuff like that. But references, mm -hmm. yeah. And we have those people fill out the forms. Yeah. Big question, would you let this person volunteer with your children? And if they say no, probably should ask them why if they're trying to do kids in. And they never and they come? never. So I'm kind of like, you need to take a tear break that, like, you're not actually serving. Yeah. Like, how do you graciously approach that? Or what do you do? Like, is there a way that you grab at your hand to say no because I'm not totally on the same page? Or like so that's my rule of three. Yeah. I give them three opportunities to, like, return to something. Yeah. And then I do have, like, a running list of people that I'll reach out for random things. Like, this would be an event like that. Right. I haven't seen somebody in a really long time. We would reach out to, like, a backup list to give opportunity to get back in the game, but it's three. And then I'm like, you, you've self, you silently quit. You told me you were in, but you're not here anymore. So I'm not going to keep chasing you because there are other people that um, you don't know about yet that you haven't given opportunity to. So. Um, <laughs> I, once a year we communicate to that, that to them. Uh, we do use PCO for all of our scheduling. So that little lovely wheel that shows like how many they said yes to and no to, I love that wheel. Um, and I run reports to just say, you know, going forward, are you committing this year? And if not, we hope that, can I direct you? I'm a big, can we direct you to another ministry in this church? So like with mine, maybe they don't want to be on the welcome team anymore. That's okay. But how would I connect you to this or that, right? So I had uh, a welcome team member that 
went on mat leave because she had her second child coming back, I followed up because she said, hey, at this point I'll be ready. So I make a note and I have a calendar and reminder. And then she left me for the worship team, which is okay. That's good. <laughs> she wants to try it. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan thinks that's great. Yeah, so, um, which is good. I wanted to know she was still involved. That's for me, again, the knowing part. I want to know my people enough to know that they are still present, active, and here. I never like the where did so-and-so go without knowing the why. That's your overachiever, yes, which was me. Um, there are some roles that you can do multiple things in here. I would say for like worship and production, that's a massive undertaking here. We do have some people on my team that sit on the kids' team. One of the things that we've done in our church, we have four weeks, like week one, two, three, and four. Every single serving team here, other than worship and production, like our bookstore, our kidsmen, we all have the same schedule. So if you're on team 2A, you could also be on 4A in a different ministry. So that was one thing that we found, especially for families too, that wanted to be in different things but um, in different areas. That kept consistency, but we would never say no, but we would be mindful. We call it poaching volunteers. Because, right, 20% of the people here are doing everything, all the work, 80% of the work. Um, so we are mindful. We track, again, we use, we use PCO for a lot of that so that we know where other people are serving and what we're asking. Planning center, yes, sorry. Yeah, it's planning center. So we use that to um, kind of gauge. Like when somebody comes to me and they're like, I want to be on, do, do such and such. And I look at it and I'm like, okay, you're a small group leader. You're also a youth small group leader. You're on the worship team. Do, do you have the ability to get, give that time? And some people do. Some people are, you know, they don't have necessarily families or other responsibilities, and they can do that, and that's great. But then I'm, I'm very mindful to check what else they're doing. Yep. That's not true. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> I, you, you guys get the good version. Yeah. That was yeah, the earlier oh, session. Yeah. She talked about <laughs> recruiting. I, I didn't have to go to that lane. But it was, like, yeah. Um, so to be honest, sometimes here, and, and again, we look like we're big, bright, and shiny, right? We're, we're like every other church. That the same situation is happening here. Um, we've had to not do things. So we don't have kids ministry at the 12 o'clock. And it's like, we don't have the leaders. So you don't have kids ministry. Or we don't have nursery workers, so there's a sign. Sorry, there's no, like, and it pains me to do that. But at the same time, you can't do something you don't have. So sometimes we don't have a guitar player. Sometimes we don't have a bass player. Like, we go without um, while trying to do everything. We, we, we do the announcements. We shoulder tap. We, who do you know that does this? Uh, yeah, it's hard because until you almost put the call out, and obviously, I don't know about your guys' situations, if Robbie was to sit there and say something from the front, everybody seems to hear it, mm -hmm. our lead pastor, right? And you, But you don't want to go there every single time. Mm -hmm. So we would actively go to our small group ministry to tell them of needs, to concentrated lists that you're always talking to. So you, you usually you're communicating to your small groups, you're, you're, you're constantly communicating to your students in youth ministry of different things that can happen. But sometimes we just go without. Yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, because they're technically in our our situation. You're supposed to be serving in a small group and being a member. Like those are kind of all together. So yeah, it's an opportunity. They want the swag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I 
somebody being brought to you? Caught him. Sorry. I would caught him. I would do it. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> what could they do that would still be helpful? So that person coaching, maybe they don't have a direct access to the leadership part, but they are picking up balls and putting the stuff away. And how do you get them around people? I do. On my welcome team, we have students that serve, and I know that they don't love Jesus. It, it, quite honestly, I, like I do know that. Um, I'm pretty open and honest when I have those conversations. Like, where are you in this journey? Because their parents have said you have to get your volunteer hours. Mm -hmm. But I love the opportunity for them to see other believers um, and being surrounded by that. There's a cutoff point to that for me, though. So once high school comes, I'm like, okay, we do need to have a bigger conversation. But there's no reason why that person can't be in the parking lot for me. So I find a place. Uh, our food pantry, a lot of students will serve in there, stocking shelves and marking up tins and stuff like that. So I do try to include them in a the right spot, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Those, I'm never going to put them in a situation where they're caring spiritually over anybody, even teaching and kids ministry. Um, yeah, so it's, it is opportunity because I can go back to years ago now. Like we had a student say all of the right things on a mission trip. All the right things. He got saved on the mission trip. He got through the interview process. So the Lord it could be doing something with opportunity. So I, it's a, yeah, it's hard. But finding an appropriate place where you can absorb what's going on but not be responsible or accountable. I would love to say yes perfectly every single time, but um, that is our goal. We have three to choose from. We do have some, again, I'll use the welcome team because that's where my most, my time is spent right now. That volunteer opportunity is set up where you can worship and work at the same time. So for those that are really busy and don't have, they can't possibly serve in kids ministry and then go to another one, I would strongly be like, join this team because the role is only 45 minutes at the front end attend service and still get poured into you don't want people that are empty and prioritizing and like I was that person like I just wanted to serve and then it, you know I'm not doing this because I'm focused on that but we have a responsibility for sure to promote that but that's the goal yeah. that's the goal but that's coming from knowing people if you know your people you know wait a second you served the last 12 out of 13 services and I saw you in the cafe the whole time <laughs> Worship and work is our goal. Anything else? You can stand here if this is not part of this, but I'm my formal part of this is done, and there's probably still coffee and snacks out there if you want to be the first ones to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any questions up here too, if that works. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yes, I reprinted your name tag because you made a mistake on it. Anyway, um, well, that was Bernadette, but I, I forgot mine today. Oh, that's okay. Okay. No, the Turks and Caicos one, all 